Hi, my name is Lauren Centrella, and I'm the Director of Development here at WAMU. As a public media organization, our mission is to connect listeners and members like you to each other and the world. Public radio works because listeners and members who value the service step up and give back. Support from listeners and members is also our most reliable and important source of funding, especially right now. This book club would not be possible if we did not have your support. Whether this is your first book club event or your 10th, if you enjoy the discussion today, please consider making a gift to support this series of events. You can donate at dianereem.org slash give. We are grateful for the nearly 1,000 people who registered to join us today. I wanted to let you know that this event is being recorded and closed captioning is available. Just click the button on your screen. And now let's start the discussion with the host of our book club, Diane Rehm. Thank you, Lauren. And to all of you, welcome to the June meeting of the Diane Rehm Book Club. And today we discuss The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak, released in 2005 as an adult novel, it became an international phenomenon embraced by audiences of all ages. The book tells the story of a young girl in Nazi Germany and introduces readers to her foster parents, neighbors, and a young Jewish man hiding in her basement narrated by the death. It is extraordinary, but it's tra tragic, haunting, but also full of love and even hope. Today, joining me are Gabrielle Savitt, author of The Way Back, and Anna and the Swallow Man. Virginia Zimmerman, English professor at Bucknell University and author of The Rosemary Spell, and Peter Fritchie, history professor at the University of Illinois and author of Hitler's First Hundred Days. As always, We'll take your questions throughout our discussion. You can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Thank you all so much for being with us. It's great to have you. Gabrielle, I want to start with you. You've written two young adult novels. One takes place during World War II, but you had never read The Book Thief until now. Tell us why and tell us what you thought of it. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it, you don't need me to tell you that The Book Thief is an absolutely extraordinary work. Um, I so enjoyed <laughs> reading it. Uh, and it, it's particularly uh, notable, I guess, that I hadn't read it up to this point, because not only do both of my uh, works that have been released so far uh, share a fair amount <laughs> of DNA in one way or another with The Book Thief, but as it happens, both my agent and my editor and the narrator of my audiobooks are shared with those of the book thief. Um, <laughs> and I think in some ways that may be one of the reasons that uh, I was resistant to reading it early on in my career. Uh, I, I think I was a little bit uh, worried about, uh, you know, accusations of, of influence. Um, but the experience of reading it for me now, you know what it's, it's quite like? Um, I, a couple of years ago, just before the birth of my younger daughter, I bought a used minivan, 
And just the other day, I was out frantically searching for some important document in, in the van, and I happened to pick up the console between the drivers and passenger seats. And I found an old pair of broken reading glasses from the former uh, owner of the minivan. And all of a sudden, it was brought forth to me that like, you know, I thought this was my car. I thought this was my area. This was my book. But all of a sudden, you know, I'm intimately acquainted uh, with the the folks who have have been here before me uh, it was almost spooky in certain ways really yeah i mean the, the thing that really took my breath away um you know anna and the swallow man my first novel is uh set in a similar milieu to the book thief um and it shares i think some aesthetic goals uh in certain ways and it's a little bit more on the magical realist side than the book thief uh, but one major theme of that book um, is the representation of certain characters in a sort of bird-like fashion. Mm -hmm. So when I was reading The Book Thief and I came to the standover man and I saw that Max Vandenberg had drawn himself as a giant bird, I, I had put the book down and like reflect on how spooky this was uh, for a little while. I, it's There must be something in the sort of you know, Jungian collective unconscious uh, <laughs> about birds uh, and the experience of the Second World War. But, it, you know, it was a really tremendous experience for me. And, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm so uh, glad. Spooky, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And Virginia, I gather you teach this book in a college course on young adult literature. Why? What do you think it is that this book does for young adults and, as we now know, for the entire population of adults? I, I think this book, I, I tend to teach this young adult class chronologically, so we often read it quite late in the semester as we come up into the 21st century. Um, and we talk a lot over the course of the semester as we investigate the genre of young adult fiction about what, what books do for young people. And I think they do the same things for young people that they do for any readers. The important difference is that young people are in the process of figuring out who they're going to be, a process that of course doesn't stop as we become adults, but that's the urgent business of being a young person, right? Is to decide what you're going to be, who you're going to become. And what children read or what young people read plays a really important role in that, as we see in the book, right? The book thief dramatizes that as Liesel crafts herself out of and around and through the books that she first takes without being able to read and then is able to read, you know, with Hans to herself and then to others and then even become a writer um, as, you know, as she as, as we near the end of the book. Um, and so the work that the book does in the, in, you know, in the sequence of investigating the genre of young adult fiction is it offers a wonderful capstone to that conversation we've been having about what books are for and how books matter mm -hmm. to young people because the, the book thief itself as a book matters, right? It teaches young people how to get through trauma, how to experience loss, right? How, uh, how to handle many of the hard things that hopefully they haven't yet had to face in their own personal lives. And um, we should say right there that the book begins with Liesel, our young heroine, on a train with her mother and her young brother who literally dies in her arms, in Liesel's arms. Then her mother has to give her, give Liesel to an orphanage. And that is how she ends up with her foster parents. Peter Fritchie, you are an historian who knows this whole period very well. How did the novel in your eyes, measure up to what you know about the history of that 38, 39 period and what was going on in small uh, German villages? Well, this was my secondary reading of the book, so I, I reread it, I read it originally. And um, 
there's two levels to answer your question. Uh, there are a lot of uh, inaccuracies in the book, um, not just inaccuracies, uh, very misleading um, plot turns. And if you're setting a book against the Holocaust, you, you need to be to be quite careful. And um, and so we can go into those things. Well, give but, me an example. Well, there, there was no book burning in 1939, 1940. It's dated in spring 1940. Uh, it would be very, very hard to believe that there were these Jew parades through a small town, certainly not in 1942. Um, the poverty of the family is implausible uh, in a uh, full economy, full war economy, um, that people would fire their washing woman is also implausible because the problem in Germany was not lack of money, but a lack of goods to buy. The savings rates went up throughout the war. And finally, that a whole street could be bombed by American bombers is also uh, implausible. You know, it's so interesting. But, I have a but. <laughs> uh, but. Just let me put in one word there. He only mentions the Allies and the Americans twice in the book. And those were the bombs that were coming over that small village. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead with your but. There's a larger truth, though. Um, when you think about my grandparents' generation, and both sets lived in Germany at the time, uh, this is a period of uh, mass death. And it's very difficult for Americans to understand. Um, there are 2 million uh, mostly uh, military casualties in World War I. That's what the mayor's wife suffers from, her loss of her son. Uh, and then three times as many casualties, 6 million uh, Germans, uh, in World War II, not to speak of the casualties that the Germans caused. And so death, the narrator, but also death, the phenomena, of course, creeps into all parts uh, of life. And this is a very real part of, um, of German life. My own mother was bombed. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 and of course, in, in, there's the background or the, 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 <laughs> the other foreground, really, of, of the persecution of Jews and the destruction of other countries. And so German soldiers going thousands of miles away to fight battles that, that weren't very clear why they were doing it. Mm. This phenomena uh, is very well described by Death, who um, talks about his, his difficulties in transporting the souls up, up to heaven and, and, and is yet cognizant of the differences uh, between somebody who dies in a bomb shelter, someone who dies in a in Stalingrad, and someone who dies in a, a, a death camp, and so I think in that sense uh, the book is extremely um, poignant, and I don't want to use the word accurate, but 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 tells us something, and 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 strikes me as a historian as well. You touched on such an important fact of the book, namely Virginia, that death is the narrator. And I wonder how your young students react to that idea of death, telling us not only what he's thinking, but he's recognizing the differences between those who <clears throat> die in one place, as Peter says, as opposed to another. How do they react? I mean, I think there's two reactions. There's simple yeah. awe. I mean, it's just it's, oh. it's genius on Zuzak's part to to cast death as his narrator. Um, and you know, and I, I often have students who are writers themselves or, or aspire to be writers, and so just just the the cleverness of it. Um, but then the reason it's genius, the reason it's clever is because it's a way of tackling this, you know, obviously dark and, and complicated topic um, in, a, in a way that doesn't soften it, right? I, I mean, 
no punches are pulled in this book. As, as you said before, right, we begin with the death of Liesl's six-year-old brother, and she's haunted by that, you know, almost until the end of the book when she's haunted by other things. Um, but the, but that death is our companion, right? Death is the reader's companion through this story and has a very sort of quiet charisma um, that you, you want to be with this narrator. You want to listen to his story. You want to be at his side as he tells you this tale. Um, and that way in which Zuzak is able to offer a, a bleak and honest encounter with death, but at the same time, make death our friend. Um, it's just staggering genius, really, in my and opinion. And Gabrielle, there is also the sense of humor that death brings into it occasionally. What was your reaction to that? Oh, I adored the humor. I think, you know, it's interesting, actually, <clears throat> in a long litany of uh, bizarre uh, sort of similarities between the work of uh, myself and Marcus Susak. My second book, The Way Back, features death prominently as a character. Uh, and we have quite different takes uh, on the character of death. And so one of the things that I was really deeply drawn to was Marcus's particular sort of shading of the character of death. And I think humor is a big uh, part of that. Also, uh, you know, the sort of natural um, aversion to human suffering that we that we naturally will share uh, <laughs> with death's perspective, the fascination uh, and sort of indulgence in certain sensory perceptions obviously at the beginning of the book death uh, goes on about uh his love for color in a sort of tour de force setting of, of the this, this stage um which is very I don't know, attractive i think but you, i think you're absolutely right diane that the humor is a, a really central force uh in the portrayal of death in the book thief in one particular moment uh it sticks in my memory i love it so much um it's when death uh, says that he's amused by the depiction of the human depiction of death as the Grim Reaper with the scythe. Yes. Uh, it's just, ah, yes. it's phenomenal. What a, yes. what a notion. Yes, indeed. And some of the ways, as Gabrielle just mentioned, talking about what's coming next, he gives us a hint of who's going to live not until the very end does he tell us about the most important characters in the book but along the way death tells us what's going to happen how do kids feel about that is that an important part of the book's appeal to young people. I, I think it is. I think, you know, I mean, it's a really um, deft use of a sort of metatextual dramatic irony, wherein the narrator is letting the reader in on information that the characters don't have. And he actually tells us even about those main characters, the ones who just tug your heart out when you get to the end of the book, he tells us at the beginning of the book that they're going to die. And yep. we don't, we don't listen because we don't want to believe <laughs> it's true. You know, and that process, right? The way in which we choose to ignore this narrator when we don't like what he's telling us, right? That's a really interesting conversation to have with my students. But I think especially for young readers, we talk a lot about the ways in which um, being, being given the opportunity to engage in active reading empowers them. And any choice that an author can make that empowers young readers, I think draws young people to the text. I want to go back to Liesl, Peter, because in the beginning, as her little brother is buried, she finds a book called something like The Guide to um, The Grave Digger's Guide to Burial or something like that. And she doesn't know how to read, but she wants to read. Now, the fact that she does not know how to read may be one of your problems with the book that this young German girl with her mother and her little brother her father has been killed in the war. 
that she doesn't know how to read. I was surprised at that. Did that bother you at all? Well, at a literal level, it's it's implausible that somebody born in um, February 1929 would not receive normal schooling, no matter you know what the working class district is uh, in Germany. But there's a larger point, and that is that why does the author use um, these defiantly innocent children in order to tell the story? And by defiantly, I mean in poverty, uh, um, without her parents in a foster home, and without being able to read. And one has this also. One has this in very prominent post-1945 German literature, most prominently in Gunter Grass's The Tin Drum with the uh, character Oscar. Uh, but there's other, there's other books that I can point to. And I, I just find it very interesting that there is this use of the uh, innocent child in order to comment on what I guess would be then the corrupt society, a kind of Rousseauian vision. And I see this again and again uh, in the way that German literature deals with post-1945 or with pre-1945. And I just wonder if if the um, other panelists might might have might have a thought on that, the use of of these child characters and what's the advantage, but also what's the disadvantage, because it erases the ideological dimensions of political behavior uh, in multiple elections and multiple situations uh, in, in the 1930s. Gabrielle. Yeah, I I would argue that I, th I think um, it's not a use of uh, defiantly innocent characters to tell the story. I, I would argue that the story is about the defiant innocence of the children. In, in a large part, I think the project of the book uh, concerns the construction of this sort of bubble of almost idyllic protected childhood under the most difficult circumstances. I mean, there's a, I, you have to look no further than the name of the street upon which Liesl grows up. It's Himmel Street, right? It's, it's heavenly in a certain yeah, sense, despite the fact that all of these terrible things are going on uh, in the larger environment. Uh, I think, you know, we, it starts off uh, with this wonderfully difficult uh, arrival at the home of the Hoobermans and uh, it climaxes uh, at the destruction of this protected bubble of childhood, which of course, unfortunately, as we, we know, childhood never lasts as long as we'd like it to. Um, but I think uh, you raise some interesting questions, Professor Fritchie, about what the innocence elides in the history. Um, and it's notable to me uh, as someone who's interested in history and also uh, as a deeply Jewish individual um, that none of our protagonists seem to share any prejudice against Jews, uh, which is interesting and uh, I certainly know very, very much less about this history than you do, but to borrow your term, it strikes me as a bit implausible. Does it strike you the same way? Well, first of all, uh, please, Peter, <laughs> um, the, the, we don't know how Nazis are grown. And, and we also ultimately don't know how non-Nazis are grown, short <laughs> of reading books. Sure. But the fact of the matter is, is that they did read books. Um, the most supportive Nazis were university students mm. and their professors. Um, books that bo Marcus himself says, without words, the Fuhrer would be nothing. This is a brilliant insight. He, he has these words, he grows them, then he tells stories, adds symbols to them, and it becomes a narrative that is extremely strong uh, for, for Germans. And and it is, it is precisely words and precisely books and precisely narrative that is at the root of National Socialism, which is an answer to trauma and loss. At the same time, you do have members of the Nazi party 
within that small village. And they are encouraging um, her adopted, her foster father, Hans, to become a member of the Nazi party, which he really refuses to do. At one point, she says out loud, I hate the Fuhrer. I hate Hitler. And Hans tells her she mustn't say that out loud because other villagers who are part of the Nazi party may well hear her. So in my eye, she represents that voice of sanity in the midst of a growing cloud of fear and hatred and exile for the Jews, Virginia. Well, yeah, and I think if I can take us back to the original question that, that launched us into this part of the discussion, I think that it's true that the innocence of Liesel and, and Rudy also does elide a lot of the particulars of the history, but I would guess that that was Zuzak's intent, right? I think that Liesel's reaction to what's happening around her, Liesel's feelings towards Max, Liesel's feelings when Max leaves, Liesel's feelings at the end of the book, right? Um, I, I think that all of that, those, those, or I go back, Peter, to what you said at the beginning about there are ways in which there are inaccuracies, but there's something bigger that's that's true. And I think that it's from the child's perspective that we can see those feelings of loss, those feelings of abandonment, those feelings of confusion. The feelings matter more in this book than the particulars that prompt them, right? It doesn't matter why Liesel's mother had to give her up. It matters that she was given up. And it doesn't matter why people died. It matters that they died from the child's point of view. If Zuzak wanted to write The Book Thief 2, and we got Liesel's adult perspective on these events, that would be very different. And we wouldn't get it, he couldn't get away with the elision in that context. But for a child, it becomes a way to make those feelings more accessible because they're not tied to particulars. And so any child who has experienced loss, any child who's had nightmares, who's wet the bed, who's, who's had conflict with their mother, right? All of those children can identify with Liesel because of the elision, right? Because it's not too specific. And what about the mayor and his wife? The mayor's wife who gives Liesel the laundry and then on one day invites her to see her immense library, knowing that Liesel is somehow knowing that Liesel is fascinated by books and allowing her to sit and read until the mayor, her husband, discovers Liesel. And boy, is he not welcoming. Why is he so unpleasant, Gabrielle, to her? <laughs> well, you know, we're talking about the ways in which uh, Liesel's social surroundings may or may not align with the general sort of political um, uh, environment uh, in Germany in this period of time. Uh, I think one of the things that Marcus does very well is that he doesn't insulate her entirely from right. Nazism and anti-Semitism. And I think uh, the mayor's presence there as an unpleasant individual uh, helps to sprinkle some of that harshness around the edges of the sort of Himmel Street bubble. Um, and, you know, I, I think I, I think Professor Zimmerman is absolutely right that the uh, elisions are intentional and functional and help to uh, accomplish the goal of the book. Um, and that includes, I think, the places that that the unpleasantness pokes through um, the sort of edges. However, I think uh, Marcus does a lot of really interesting things with unpleasantness that aren't just moralistic. 
so one of the things that I love about this book is its use of profanity. Um, I'm not a German speaker, uh, but the way that Frau Huberman is presented constantly spewing German profanity at first strikes us as uh, almost threatening and becomes over the course of the book uh, warm and affectionate in, in the most wonderful way. And I think and it's certainly great... coming from the mother, coming yeah, from right. Rosa, who <laughs> calls her husband, the child, everybody around by the worst names uh, in German. And yet, as you say, it becomes sort of turned into a loving use of language it's it's almost an earthiness that uh that uh, dismantles uh the ideological propaganda language mm -hmm. uh you know Zauschwein and you know you, you pig and all of this 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 uh, resists um the Fuhrer's words huh. Huh. And it's fascinating to me also that as the book progresses, Liesl sort of appropriates this abusive language as a mark of affection, right? It becomes a sort of a secret language with Rudy that they, this is how they mark affection for one another. Um, and it's particularly notable to me uh, because it highlights the use of another pseudo profane word, I would say, in the book. Um, obviously, the book is written in English, though there's judicious and liberal use of German language. So the German profanity, if you're not a native German speaker, doesn't quite hit with the same sort of visceral intensity that that English language profanity would. However, uh, Marcus uses the word of the noun Jew extraordinarily effectively in this book. Um, a good friend of mine, Mark Oppenheimer, has a, a sort of uh, example, uh, sort of uh, thought experiment about this, about the coding of the, the noun Jew in the English language. If you're standing in line at the supermarket and you hear someone having a conversation on the phone behind you and they say, oh, you know, he's a real Christian, you know how, how to interpret that. If you hear the same person say, oh, he's a real Jew, you have a very different reaction, right? And I think it reflects uh, very strongly on some very deep-seated um, prejudices in certainly European cultures, uh, English speaking cultures as well. Um, but what's really great is that the way Marcus deploys Jew unapologetically uh, sort of implicates you in the broader uh, prejudice of the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have this little frisson of, of resistance that isn't strong enough to get you to put the book down, right? Like you feel like, oh, a little unsettled. In fact, I, I marked a, a particularly good use of it that I'd love, may I read it briefly? Certainly, please. I think it, uh, I think it gives a really good example here. We're um, about halfway through the book on page 210. Uh, the days hobbled on. Each night before the descent into sleep, she would hear mama and papa in the kitchen discussing what had been done what they were doing now and what needed to happen next. All the while, an image of Max hovered next to her. It was always the injured, thankful expression on his face and the swamp-filled eyes. Only once was there an outburst in the kitchen. Papa, I know. His voice was abrasive, but he brought it back to a muffled whisper in a hurry. I have to keep going, though, at least a few times a week. I can't be here all the time. We need the money, and if I quit playing there, they'll get suspicious. They might wonder why I've stopped. I told them you were sick last week, but now we have to do everything like we always have. Therein lay the problem. Life had altered in the wildest possible way, but it was imperative that they act as if nothing at all had happened. Imagine smiling after a slap in the face, then think of doing it 24 hours a day. That was the business of hiding a Jew. It and just punches the end. Right? I know, yeah. and let's talk about Max, hmm. who has come to Liesel Hans and Rose's home because of a debt, Virginia, that Hans felt he owed Max's father. It was an extraordinary turn of events, and the accordion 
was all part of it. Yeah, I think though that by the time we learn why Hans felt a debt to Max's father, I think we know Hans well enough to know that he it wouldn't take much to call in a debt from Hans, right? He's a fundamentally good and kind person, right? We see that when he tries to help the some of the Jews being marched down the street, right? He doesn't know them. He owes them nothing other than that they're human beings, right? So I think it's it's interesting that we're given that backstory and that we're we're offered that sort of deep explanation for why why Hans would put his family at risk, why he would take this risk himself. But I think Hans would have taken the risk anyway, right? I don't, I think we learned that about him. But once he does take the risk, which is to put a loaf of bread in the midst of these Jews as they are being paraded through the small town, he knows he's made a terrible mistake, Peter. He knows that he will be singled out for having made that so-called mistake of acting like a decent human being. Exactly. Uh, that That is so, um, to us, seems so uh, uh, derivative of Mac, of, 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 of Hans, Hans, that he would do that. And yet he can't do that if he's hiding a Jew, which is exactly what that passage uh, had underscored. What's interesting, though, is that the fact that um, Max's father was a veteran of World War I or, or soldier of World War I means that Marcus knows that Jews did fight in World War I and uh, fought proportionally just as much, actually a little bit more. Uh, than anybody else. And that put that deletes the Nazi lie uh, that Jews are unpatriotic and that Jews did not fight. So so that's actually that's actually an important detail. And also World War I, in other ways, constantly erupts because Hans himself had a traumatic experience. Uh, the mayor's wife uh, lost her son. And so World War I, keeps erupting. It does erupt right. though in different ways. I mean, for Hitler, it erupts in, a, in one way and for, for, Hans in, for, for Hans in another way. But, but the reader, the book was, of course, uh, marketed as an adult novel in Australia. Uh, the reader does want to know more about motivation and therefore uh, about context. I mean, it would seem that the town is a working class town Therefore, it's social democratic. Therefore, it's not inclined to be Nazi, uh, certainly among the poor people um, like the Hubermans. Um, so that, that begins to explain a few things. But nonetheless, we still don't know why, uh, actually, uh, people become Nazis or why people don't mm -hmm. uh, and why people become anti-Nazis. It's not, it's not entirely clear, especially against the background that most people were not anti-Nazis. People didn't hide Jews. Uh, people didn't put bread into the parades. And uh, maybe they were scared, maybe they were indifferent, but these things didn't happen. Uh, and certainly there are not people who read books and suddenly became anti-fascists. Um, unfortunately, that was just simply not the case. The Germans were ejected out of their Third Reich because of mass death late in the game, late 44, early 45. And then, sure, I mean, your towns are in ruin, your sons are dead, right. and uh, the Fuhrer has basically betrayed you. He's, he's, he's destroyed the beloved Third Reich. That's why one, people untied themselves from Nazism, not because they read a book. One of my favorite portions of the book is titled Pages from the Basement. It was Liesel's birthday and Max had nothing to give her. And so he took the book Mein Kampf yeah. right. and painted over the pages and drew his own wonderful 
pictures telling her a little about himself. I thought that was so incredibly rich as a part of the book, Virginia. I would imagine the young people really enjoyed seeing those cartoon-like drawings and the printed word beside them. Yeah, I think part of what's so interesting about that part of the book as it's printed is that Mein Kampf does bleed through, right? right. And so you're not allowed to forget what Max wrote that story on, right? That he, and of course, Mein Kampf was instrumental in his movement, um, I don't remember where he began, but in his movement to the Huberman's home, right? It was Mein Kampf that was essentially what allowed him to appear to not be Jewish as he traveled. So the book, and he says to Liesl, this is the book that saved my life. But then he he paints over top of those words, right? It's a it's a literal palimpsest, and those and Hitler's words bleed through, but are obscured by exactly. Max's pictures and, and Max's words. And and what the student, my students find most compelling about that is, is the way that Hitler is still there, right? Max is trying. Crying. Max is telling us a story and giving this to Liesl, but Mein Kampf is still there. Here's a question from one of our viewers. She says, or he says, my mom introduced me to the book thief when she passed away in 2018. At her memorial service, I read the passage about the cloud from the 13 presence chapter. The passage begins, and then the cloud. How do you give someone a piece of the sky? One of my favorite things about Marcus's writing is lines like this, which stop you in your tracks, literally make you put the book down. Does anyone on the panel have a favorite example of one of those book stopping lines from the novel? I know, Virginia, you had something you wanted to read from page 138. Yeah, I, I mean, when you, when you frame the question that way, it's hard to pick one example because there are so many. And this I know. Book stopping is a great way to put it. But I, I do quite like this passage on 138. And I and I think it speaks to a lot of the things we've talked about. The, the chapter begins, enter the struggler. And the narrator says, now for a change of scenery. We've both had it too easy till now, my friend, don't you think? How about we forget mulking for a minute or two? It will do us some good. Also, it's important to the story. We will travel a little to a secret storage room and we will see what we see. A guided tour of suffering. To your left, perhaps your right, perhaps even straight ahead, you find a small black room. In it sits a Jew. He is scum, he is starving, he is afraid. Please try not to look away. What's so interesting about that line is that it's uh, exhortation uh, to the present. And I wonder if you would agree with me that this is a book about how it should have been, mm. how it possibly could have been, given the material of 1933, but how it wasn't. It wasn't. The only people who really thought about humanity and duty and solidarity were Jews. I think, though, I think you're right that it's an exhortation to the present, right? And it's it's in conversation with never forget, right? It's it is. Maybe it wasn't that way in the 1930s, but it could have been. It could have been, and and we could easily find ourselves in a similar situation. Right. And we mustn't look away. We mustn't look away from what we can learn from the past, what happened or what didn't happen, nor can we look away from similar suffering in the present day. 
<laughs> That's undoubtedly the case. But I'd also like to speak up for the, the, the writers for a moment as, as the resident writer on the panel. Uh, Peter, you're, you're admirably and I think correctly, uh, given your area, concerned with the historicity of the book. Um, and also, uh, I feel pretty strongly as a writer who works almost exclusively in historical settings, that the writer's uh, obligation uh, is not to the historical record, but rather, you know, it's it's to uh, the the project of of giving someone a a, a cloud. Um, you know, we what we do is <laughs> to construct uh, what is hopefully an otherwise ineffable experience of uh, other people's lives uh, to sort of telepathically transmit via the written word. Um, and while it's desperately important, desperately important to keep our eye on the truth of what happened in Europe in the, uh, the early part of the middle of the century, the 20th century, um, I think it's also very important to allow for uh, sort of ahistorical constructions of experience that are focused on things that we can talk about, that, but that we can't quite say. Does that make sense? Well, and I think part of what's happening in this particular passage is that Zuzak is, is signaling to the reader, this is about to get harder, mm. right? This book has been hard already yeah. and it's getting harder. So buckle up, here we go. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that is about him speaking quite directly to the reader about the kind of feeling he's asking the reader to sign up for. Right. And with that difficulty in mind, we've gotten this question twice. Why is The Book Thief considered a young adult novel? We know that so many adults have enjoyed it, and it takes on very complicated issues, Virginia. Well, I mean, as I think Peter mentioned before, it, it was originally marketed as an adult novel. Um, and it was when it came to America that it found its way onto the shelves in the children's book section. Huh. Um, but it, it, it was thought of, I don't think Zuzak thought of it as a novel for young people. It's been taken over by young people because the protagonist is young, um, which is not a good enough reason. But I would respond to the question more deeply to say that I think it's really essential deeply essential that children's books take on really difficult topics. The difficulty of the material um, does, does in no way disqualifies it as a book for, for young people. It is essential for young people to read about hard things. Um, and, uh, and, and this book puts them face to face with that. It also, right, this book has also been very widely read all over the world by adults. Indeed. And who have also gotten a tremendous amount out of it. But the fact that it's dark, that it's hard, um, that it doesn't pull its punches, as I said before, um, it simply makes it a very good children's book, I would say. And Peter, this to a point that you have made, our caller says, this is fiction. How much leeway should an author have to change events in order to tell the story? Well, I, I think uh, novelists have, have a great deal of leeway, but the novel is, in fact, grounded in history. There are dates and there are places. And so if you put Jews in Dachau, you're wrong. And then don't use Dachau and don't use 1942 and don't use Max. But mm. if you are going to do them, you can't put them all together. Not that there weren't certain Jews in Dachau, but Max would have gone to Auschwitz. Max would have not been paraded down the street. My takeaway is that death embraces life. But there's two kinds of life because there's two kinds of words. And it's up to the reader to decide what are the words. And this is why Virginia's point about the palm set is so brilliant. I didn't realize that. You, you choose your drawing and your self-creation, or you choose the Fuhrer's words. They're both really powerful. Mm. And those are both signs of life. 
And that's what death means when he says, I see ugly, I see beauty. But he embraces, death embraces life. It's really quite interesting. I agree with the other panelists. I mean, I resisted the book at the beginning and had tears in my eyes at the end. As did I, and I'm sure all of us. Marcus Zusak has said his favorite character in the book is Rudy, <laughs> that blonde little boy, that angelic face. I watched the movie again last night, a movie that was made quite some time ago. And that little boy's face is really something. Did you have a favorite character, Virginia? Oh, gosh. Um, I do quite like Rudy. I think his is the, the, the loss that I feel most keenly. But I think if I'm picking a favorite character, I'm going to pick Death. I just really? I, I love the way he tells the story. And I, too, am a, a writer. I, I le I've learned a lot from Zuzak and from the way he chose to tell this particular story. So I think I would have to pick Death. Well, you had a brilliant line in that we want to be with Death. Yeah. I, I, th I thought that was really a key to this novel, what you just said. Which is just such an accomplishment on Zuzak's part, right? To make us choose or to make anyone, right? I, I'm sure everyone on this panel would give a different answer to who's your favorite character, but that anyone would choose death, I think says quite a lot about how this book is written. How about you, Gabrielle? I, the truth is I would choose death as well if I, if I had the first uh, draft pick. Uh, however, uh, you know, I think one of the real accomplishments of the book is the, the sense of, textured social environment. There are so many very vivid characters in the book. And in addition, obviously, to death and to Rudy, uh, I, I came away with such an affection for the Hubermans. I, you know, rough people struggling through with just a real defining sense of goodness. And, you know, I, I'm very interested in, in uh, what Peter brings up about uh, inaccuracy and about how, how plausible uh, this picture is in, in the sort of social milieu that we know from history, uh, but sort of irrespective <laughs> of, of what the history may have been, you know, that couple, I mean, I, I aspire to, to that kind of life, uh, to, to struggle through in, in a good hearted way as much as possible. Peter, I know that your parents grew up in Nazi Germany. And I wonder if you saw any echoes of their stories in this book. I did. I'll tell you two real brief stories. I mean, my mom's house was bombed. We lost all the family photographs and stuff like that. Not that that's a big tragedy. My mother was grew up in a socialist family uh, and she desperately wanted to go to Nuremberg, to the rallies where everyone else was going. And my grandmother had a hard time convincing her not to. Finally said, you know, look at the pictures. Where's, where are the latrines? Where's the porta pot? Uh, you're there for five days, you know? You're standing there, what are you gonna do? So even she, from a socialist background, was drawn into this. My father's family was very conservative and German national and basically had no problems with the Nazis. And yet my father deserted the army in 1945. Late, but he did at, at risk. <laughs> Where did this come from? So it's not just milieu, it's coming from something else. You know, my mother did something I wouldn't have expected. And my father did something I wouldn't have expected knowing their respective parents. And yet it happened. And so, you know, I, I get your frustration with my inaccuracy, talking about inaccuracies. And I said, <laughs> I wouldn't hijack the show about it. But you cannot say about the Holocaust something dead wrong. 
That's well, not, I think the thing I about I think the thing about it is that you, you can't. Marcus has. Marcus has. Right. <laughs> no. And it's been effective in a certain way. I listen. You can't. We, do we it. don't need to do. You cannot anything. do it. You can argue how ethical it is, and I think that that's an important conversation. Without conversation. without saying in a comical way or so on, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> but but you cannot suggest to readers that 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 that's happening. To parades of Jews and Dachau. That's a concentration camp, not a death camp. Gabrielle, how did you feel about the ending? Uh, oh, it's glorious. I mean, uh, you know, as a writer, in certain ways, you, you know you've uh, done what you set out to do if you write the last scene and it feels like the whole book is in it. And I think that's what we really, really get with the ending of the book, Thief. Uh, you know, the sort of reuniting between death and Liesel at the end of her life is touching and beautiful. And the way that death gives her her childhood back in a tangible form. I just, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the book is full of master strokes. And I think the ending is uh, maybe highest on the list. And how about you, Virginia? I couldn't agree more. And, and I think I've, I don't know how many times I've read this book, five, six, um, and I've taught it almost that many times. And I weep when I finish this book. Every time I know how it ends. I knew how it ended the first time I read it. And it still pulls me um, every single time. And I, I just think it's genius. Did you really? I mean, I know that this may trouble some people who haven't read it, but I mean, Death tells us early on that Liesel is going to survive, but he doesn't tell us about Rudy until a little later. And that was so sad to hear. Peter, how did you feel about the ending of the book? It's a beautiful line. I'm haunted by humans. Ah. And that is what drives the fiction writer. That's what drives the literary critic. And that's what drives the historian. And haunted, of course, has the, a double meaning. We are very haunted by humans, but haunted also in a way that death wants to hold on to the book, show the book, the book thief. And um, haunted by the possibility of, of life. Yes, and I, I had the same tears as everybody else. Well, I want to thank you all for not only your tears, but your beautiful words. I've so enjoyed talking with each of you, Gabrielle Savitt, Virginia Zimmerman, and Peter Fritchie. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'd like to hear from Marcus Zusak himself, he'll be joining me shortly on a separate Zoom link. We'll talk about how his parents' stories inspired the book Thief and why his last novel took him 13 years to write. You still have time to register for that at the link in the chat. And please, before you go, take a minute to fill out a short survey. And if you would, consider donating to WAMU. Your financial support is what makes it possible for us to bring you events like this one. Go to dianereem.org slash give. Our next meeting will be on July 27th. We'll discuss Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, the film adaptation of that best-selling novel hits theaters on July 15th. Our book club is produced by Allison Brody. Kennedy Wright has been our engineer today. Yanlin Zhang is our events manager. We couldn't do this 
event without the support of Verendra Silva, Julia Slattery, Lauren Centrella, James Coates, Dave Tate, Jerry Washington, and Michelle Morgan. A very special thanks to all of these people and to all of you for tuning in. Thanks again. See you next month. I'm Diane Rehm.